Hey, I'm Kier, and this is that vlog thing that I'm doing. The other day, I talked about the campaign of censorship against uh, horror comics. Uh, it came up in the 50s. Now, a lot of things happened leading up to that to make horror as popular as it was. And a lot of that can be attributed to Universal Pictures. Uh, Universal Studios, uh, Universal Pictures, um, was one of the largest producers of horror films, uh, by far the most famous producer of horror films, starting in the 1920s. Uh, in 1923, they put out the uh, first version of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, with Lon Chaney Sr. as the Hunchback. Uh, a couple years later, in 1925, they put out the... Uh, Phantom of the Opera, which is still one of the absolute most iconic images uh, of horror in general that you're going to find out there. Uh, they followed that up uh, through the 30s with all of the very well-known Universal Studios monsters, uh, Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy. Uh, all of those came out in the 30s and 40s. So Universal had amassed this huge amount of very popular uh, and very quickly iconic uh, horror characters. They had all the monster movies, uh, at least all the ones that most people would recognize today. Uh, and that brought a lot of these old horror stories in the case of Dracula and Frankenstein, which were based on books, and Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Phantom of the Opera, which were both also based on old stories, brought them all into the public consciousness in the movies, in the theater, right down the street. You could go and see monsters. Uh, and they had spectacular production value for their time. You're hard-pressed to find makeup as solid as Lon Chaney's classic stuff, even today, uh, it, when it comes to physical makeup effects. And he wasn't working with half the equipment we have now. Uh, and that's something that's always defined these Universal Studios monster movies, is the quality of not just their stories, but their presentation, their effects, everything that they put out has a large amount of quality to it. Well, everything in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. See, by the time we hit the 1940s and got into uh, World War II, we had a case where the horror of the real world was a whole lot scarier than what you could see on the screen. And that's when movies started becoming more and more of an escape. Yeah, during the Depression, some cheap movies made for a good escape from the reality of, of uh, life, but people had a little bit more time in the 40s uh, as we ramped up for war, and especially right after World War II. Uh, as we got through the 40s and into the 50s, we started seeing the baby boom. We saw for the first time, really, in the U.S., a youth culture begin to develop. Uh, we had a large population of preteens and teens by the time the, the uh, mid-50s rolled around. And that's all from the baby boom after the war, and that only continued on through uh, the 60s. Now, what does that have to do with horror? Well, in the 50s, uh, Universal kept cranking out horror movies. Uh, they had been cranking them all through the 40s, but something happened near the end of the 40s, near the end of the war, is a large element of humor began to show up in horror movies. Abbott and Costello started meeting these Universal Studios monsters. And then we had in the 50s more and more silly, horror movies coming out, the beginning of the horror comedy. Now, sometimes it was unintentional, uh, and it was just because they were cranking these things out like crazy, uh, and Universal was far from the only company doing this, but they still have quite the track record uh, behind them, plus the rights to all of the classic monsters that a lot of people had already seen 
on the big screen. Television changed everything. In 1957, a batch of 52 of Universal's classic monster movies were released uh, under the Shock Theater title. And what that did was that put all of these movies on TV for the first time in a lot of cases. And this was the birth of the late night horror television host. Uh, guys like John Zachary and, and women like Vampira, uh, who continue to be icons uh, even today. Uh, Zachary's 90 something years old and he's still making appearances because people remember him. And he was only in two major markets over the course of two years before he became that famous. So horror had really gotten its fangs into the uh, culture in general, but specifically into the youth culture. Because horror was seen as rebellious, especially when they started going after the horror comics. In 1954, Seduction of Innocence uh, was published and started the craze against horror comics and really horror in general, uh, as well as a few other things. Now that's, you know, a handful of years after the baby boom had started. You're starting to see more and more preteens out there reading stuff. You have a lot of uh, GIs who had been introduced to European comics, uh, which were a little higher level in some cases than a lot of the American comics at the time. So you have a more adult comic market conflicting and coming into contact with this growing youth culture. This growing youth culture that the more general culture still isn't sure what to do with. We don't need them to work on the farm. We don't need to have, uh, you know, huge families. Uh, we're seeing a shortage uh, of uh, full families because of all the uh, people who died during World War II. Not as bad in the U.S. as it was in Europe. Uh, but still, we're seeing a culture develop that, that has never been seen before in the U.S. There's free time. There's the post-war economic boom. People have disposable income. And their kids have this income to make use of. So what are they doing? They're going to the movies. They're buying horror comics. They are getting experience of all of these scary things, or these things that used to be really scary, but are starting to lose their edge from overexposure. By the time you hit the end of the 50s, everyone knows who Frankenstein's monster is. Everyone knows Dracula. There's no getting away from them in the mainstream culture. As we progress through the 50s and into the 60s, horror, the things that used to scare us, uh, are now more and more often seen as things for kids as well. So Halloween becomes a big thing in the 50s. We'll talk a little bit more about that in another video. Halloween comes along, people need costumes, so what do they dress up as? They dress up as vampires, they dress up as the mummy, they dress up as Frankenstein's monster. They dress up as the wolfman. Because their parents have seen these movies, these kids have seen these movies, all of their friends talk about these movies, they catch them late at night on, on the weekends, and so this youth culture has now fully embraced, uh, at least in a large portion, embraced this horror aesthetic. And so the movies shift in tone to be less scary and more just straight up entertaining. And then the cartoons start. 1966 saw the debut of Frankenstein Jr. and the Impossibles, a Hanna-Barbera cartoon that, that if you've ever seen it, and if you grew up in the 80s like me, you grew up on reruns of this because they were still showing it on Saturday mornings along with all of those other crazy <laughs> Hanna-Barbera cartoons uh, from the 60s, had a giant robot who looked an awful lot like Frankenstein's monster, except he wore a mask, and, and, and his... Uh, he was the sidekick of this kid, and they fought crime together. 
So you have all of these monsters are now showing up in things designed specifically for kids. And that continued on through the 70s and into the 80s, uh, where you ended up with movies like Monster Squad and cartoons like Scooby-Doo featuring these classic monsters. Uh, and so what used to be horror and nightmare fodder was now the thing of Saturday morning cartoons. And it's a fascinating transition because out in the rest of the world, during that time, we saw World War II, we saw the Korean War, we saw Vietnam. We saw our world get scarier and scarier on a regular basis, while our horror, in large part, got less and less scary until... Other horror movies kicked in, your slasher films, your uh, cannibal uh, holocaust type films, all of this gore became a thing, which is something that a lot of the classic movies never had. They never had real blood and guts and everything. When Frankenstein killed someone, it's because he snapped their neck. There was no blood. When Dracula bit into someone's neck, maybe what you got was a couple little dribbles of, of red. But when the Hammer Horror version of Dracula, uh, Hammer being the British company that started producing uh, films along the lines of the classic uh, Universal Monsters, there was blood everywhere. When the slasher films kicked off in the late 60s uh, th through, the, uh, through the 80s, especially in the late 70s and 80s, uh, there was blood and gore and nudity everywhere. This stuff became distinctly not for kids again. So even that has again looped around and Freddy and Jason and all of those other 80s horror icons are now effectively kids stuff again. Uh, the Monster High dolls, that's even for girls. Uh, tons and tons of animated uh, cartoons, uh, back when there still were Saturday morning cartoons, were featuring monsters uh, like these, except in a very humorous way. Horror tends to run in a cyclical fashion. What used to be really scary becomes commonplace. It sets itself in the uh, cultural zeitgeist and it becomes common and it's not scary anymore. So it needs to be revitalized. There needs to be something new thrown in. It becomes kid stuff. And then new horror comes along to replace that. And a lot of that depends on what's going on out in the real world. How scary is the real world? What kind of real life horrors have people been dealing with? And that gets back into the discussion from a while back about the meanings of the different monsters and how they've changed through the years. Let me know what you think. How do you think horror will be changing in the next few years? When did you first see those classic monsters like Frankenstein and Dracula? What's your favorite version of them? Let me know in the comments. If you like what I, anything I've said here, uh, give me a thumbs up down, uh, down right there. If uh, you're not subscribed, subscribe so you get notified when these come out in, uh, in your inbox. And if you know anyone else who's interested in this sort of thing and may have an opinion about any of this, uh, share this with them so they can see it and uh, we can start a discussion up. That's it for today. I'm Kier. I guess I'll see you tomorrow.